So we have three wonderful speakers uh, among us today, um, and we'll be talking um, about kidney replacement, I guess. Um, first up, we have Dr. Peter Margetz. Um, Dr. Margetz completed his undergrad at Queen's University. He is currently an associate professor in the Division of Nephrology in the Department of Medicine at McMaster University, along with being a staff nephrologist at St. Joseph's Healthcare. His main research interest lies in the mechanisms of fibrosis, and specifically looking at peri peritoneal fibrosis and the implication of the fibrosis in a per peritoneal dialysis. Um, and without further ado, I'll let Dr. Margetz take the stage. Thank you. Um, so today uh, we've got uh, three speakers. Uh, Morteza is here from Waterloo. He's an engineer, as is Dr. Kim Jones. And uh, what we're going to talk about is kidney replacement therapy. So we're talking about patients who have uh, run out of kidney function. Their kidneys no longer function. We, ha we can keep them alive through various means. And uh, I'm going to uh, discuss a little bit about what those patient characteristics are and how we keep people alive today. And I'm hoping that the next two speakers are going to give you some idea of what might be uh, possible in the future as far as uh, kidney replacement therapy. Uh, so we're going to start with an outline of chronic kidney disease. And then we'll talk a little bit about implications of chronic kidney disease for the patients and some of the options we have today for kidney replacement therapy. So <clears throat> I was told when I was much younger and started giving these talks, you should always start with a case. It keeps people awake. So this is a patient of mine who uh, was diagnosed with lupus at age 21. And uh, lupus uh, is a multi-system disease. It affects the skin, the joints, the blood system, the kidneys, the lungs, the heart, everything. And the characteristic is uh, something called a malar rash, which you can see in the patient on the left, which I stole off the internet. And lupus was, the name was derived from a a, one of the first surgeons, a uh, fellow by the name of Rogerio in about the 12th century, he uh, identified this disease and called it lupus. Lupus, of course, is uh, Latin for wolf. And it's not clear whether the, the rash is named after the facial colorations of the wolf or they get these uh, pretty nasty ulcerations which are thought to be wolf bite-like things. So it's not clear why, why it's called lupus, but uh, there you go. Uh, <clears throat> she was uh, treated, it's an autoimmune disease, so it's associated with antibodies against yourself. So she was treated with a course of immunosuppressive therapy, uh, prednisone and cyclophosphamide. Uh, she had lupus that affected her kidneys, so she had lupus nephritis. And uh, we managed to get the disease into remission, and she went on for about five more years without any uh, major symptoms. But then she had another relapse. After that point, she underwent a second course of treatment, and then about uh, six years ago, uh, she had a third relapse of the disease and unfortunately it had progressed to the point where her kidneys no longer function and she ran out of kidney function and she had to initiate peritoneal dialysis. And she was on peritoneal dialysis for only two years when she had a relative of hers was kind enough to don donate a kidney and so in 2013 she underwent a live related renal transplant. Unfortunately, that our, our kidney transplants tend to last on average about 13 years, so some kidneys will go 25 years, other kidneys go a much shorter time. She had a very uh, unfortunate course. Uh, she had a inflammation in the kidney related to antibody media rejection, and that kidney just started to scar, and we repeatedly biopsied that kidney, and as time went on, it just showed more and more scarring, and eventually she failed. Uh, the kidney transplant and she re returned to dialysis and this time she went on to hemodialysis. She has a, a husband and a cousin and several other people in the family who have all stepped forward to offer her a kidney but the interesting thing is she has developed over the course of her illness a huge amount of antibodies against uh, something called HLA. HLA is the human leukocyte antigen. It's on all of your cells and everybody has a different HLA. <coughs> this just shows some of the proteins in the HLA molecule, and for kidney transplant, we're really interested in A, B, and DR. We have to match those antigens so that the patient doesn't have antibodies against them. If they have pre-existing antibodies, when you plug that transplanted kidney in, the immune system will blow it away within a few hours to a few days. So 
um, she unfortunately has developed antibodies against a huge panel of ABDR antigens that are uh, in the community. So we cannot find a kidney that is matched for her. So I brought up this particular patient because she's a young woman. She hates dialysis. I'm her dialysis doctor, so ergo she hates me. And uh, she doesn't see much of a future. She's stuck. We, we are having a very difficult time trying to uh, find any option as far as transplant. And she's looking at a short and uh, uncomfortable life on uh, chronic dialysis. So my whole um, point in bringing people together is, is specifically to try and help this unfortunate woman and find a solution for her that we can retain her quality and quantity of life. <clears throat> chronic kidney disease, like a lot of things in medicine, we put it into stages. Uh, the kidneys are filters for your blood, and we use a, a measurement. We use a blood test called creatinine, which is an enzyme. Everyone has it in the blood. It gets filtered out by the kidneys. That's the main thing the kidneys do is they filter your blood. And when we talk about how to replace kidney function with a device, we're going to be talking about filters, essentially. Uh, so this, the GFR is the glomerular filtration rate. It's a calculated rate from the, this blood test, the creatinine. And what it tells you is how much blood the kidneys are filtering every minute. It should be about 90 milliliters of blood every minute. And then as your kidney function declines, you can see there's different stages until you get down to stage five, which is kidney failure. And we think of anything under stage three as kind of bad news. <clears throat> so here's a study from a couple of years ago. These are uh, about 4,000 patients in Canada, and they just looked at what kind of kidney disease they had. They did that blood test. And you can see that about 3% of patients in Canada have at least stage 3 chronic kidney disease. So it's actually extremely, popu uh, extremely popular, extremely common to have chronic kidney disease. Uh, chronic kidney disease is obviously going to be more common in elderly people, people with diabetes. Uh, First oh. Nations people have a high rate of chronic kidney disease. So these numbers probably are getting worse because of our population is aging. So a lot of people have this thing, and let's just go over quickly what it means if you actually have it. So this is one of my favorite slides. This is an old study now. This is from uh, uh, over 10 years ago. But this was, uh, if you look at the numbers along the top here, where 20 or 30,000 patients enrolled in the Kaiser Permanente uh, uh, insurance plan in California. So these patients are all in ch enrolled in the um, plan, and then they measured their stage of kidney function using a blood test, and then they said, well, let's see what happens to these patients in five years. And the, the interesting thing is, uh, I, I said stage three and below is kind of bad. Stage three chronic kidney disease patients, uh, you can see a quarter of them just died in that five years afterwards. So that's a pretty high rate of mortality uh, in five years compared to the rest of the population, which is around 10%. So it's about two and a half fold increased risk of dying. And then <clears throat> uh, very few of them actually ended up on dialysis. So if you go to the doctor, so I have patients come and see me and I say, I'm, I'm sorry, you've got advanced chronic kidney disease. And, and a lot of patients look at me and they say, geez, doc, does this mean I have to go on dialysis? And uh, we talk about that endlessly. But if I was honest, I'd say, no, you're probably going to die before you end up on dialysis, so don't worry about it. And stage four is even worse. Half those patients died over the course of five years before they even got to dialysis. And about a third of the patients, just under a third of the patients, actually end up on dialysis. And interestingly, oh wait, about 20% uh, ended up on dialysis. But if you look at the next line up, that's the number of patients that got transplanted. And this is a big problem we've got. We've got a lot of people who are approaching end-stage kidney disease. We have a lot of people who end up on the waiting list for a kidney transplant. We don't have enough kidneys for them. This is... This is uh, so what happens to patients with chronic kidney disease? I mentioned they die. Some of them end, end up going to end-stage renal disease. And there's a very high rate of cardiovascular disease. And we now have this heat map where we look at the, uh, both the stage of chronic kidney disease on the left side, and along the top is the amount of protein leaking the, through the kidneys, because those two factors together really pinpoint your risk of having one of these bad things happen to you. So obviously, if you have more pro protein leaking through the kidneys, if you have worse kidney function, you're going to have a bad outcome. And this is another one of my favorite slides. So this is uh, just a couple of years ago. This is about 4,000 patients in an area of the states they call the stroke belt, which is interesting. It's in the southern states, and it matches pretty much the, the Bible belt. And I'm not sure why people in the Bible belt are at high risk of strokes, but there you go. Uh, <clears throat> 
what they've, did, the, what they've done is they've taken 4,000 of these elderly patients at high risk of stroke, and they followed them up for seven years. And this is their risk of having a bad outcome as far as uh, coronary heart disease, so developing a heart attack or angina, or dying. And you can see down here, these are patients who have no risk factors. So they're still pretty high risk of bad things happening to them because they're probably in, in the southern states and they're not healthy anyways. Uh, but if you go up to the next one, this is diabetes, metabolic syndrome, which is obesity and uh, cholesterol problems or smoking. The increased risk is, it's, it's clearly there, but it's not huge. Up here is just chronic kidney disease. So these patients have nothing else. They just have chronic kidney disease. And then if you add the two together, it's at the top. So if I were to say to you, you know, you could have diabetes or chronic kidney disease, which would you take? Most people go for the chronic kidney disease because, heck, nobody wants to have diabetes. But if you look at this, always pick the diabetes. Mm -hmm. if, if a doctor's selling you a disease, pick the one that sounds like the worst one because you're going to do better with it. Don't get chronic kidney disease. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm going to go and... Uh, so one of the outcomes from chronic kidney disease is this progression to end-stage renal disease, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the options we have there. And here's the options outlined here, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, transplantation, and conservative management, which means we don't do anything. Here's a little history lesson for you. This, this uh, guy named Willem Kolf was a... Uh, uh, I think he's from the Netherlands, and in the 1940s, he built one of these things, which is a coil dialyzer. So this is one of the first hemodialysis machines ever built. You can see it's, a, it's from the Walter Reed Army Medical Center. So these things were used for acute kidney injury. For instance, uh, somebody in a battlefield who got injured developed acute kidney injury. They knew they were young and healthy, and they'd probably recover. They just needed a couple of dialysis treatments to tide them over until their kidneys recovered. So this was in the 40s and the 50s. Uh, they developed these types of things uh, to replace kidney function. Then in the 60s, uh, mostly because of this, which, uh, which was uh, an invention by a surgeon called, by the name of uh, Scribner, and he developed a way that we could access the blood system uh, re repeatedly. And this is, so that's a Scribner shunt. And what that allowed them uh, is to hook a patient up to hemodialysis on a routine basis. And, and so this was actually, this fellow's name is Clyde Shields, and in the 1960s he was the very first chronic dialysis patient, which means he was hooked up to this machine, which is in the white box behind him, and he was dialyzed uh, routinely uh, three times a week for about eight or ten hours. And he lived, I think, seven or eight years on chronic dialysis. The problem is it was very expensive, very limited technology. Scribner was in Seattle, and this whole system started to be used in Seattle, and they suddenly had a flood of patients who wanted to get chronic dialysis treatment, and they didn't have enough money or technology or uh, uh, spots to do them in. So they actually developed a panel. These darkened figures over here are the death panel, and they would get together. Your, your doctor would submit your name saying, uh, you know, Peter Margetz, he's a nice guy, uh, friendly sort, you know, unfortunately he's got chronic kidney disease and I think he should go on this treatment. Uh, unfortunately, I don't make the criteria here, but the criteria is pretty strict. You have to be otherwise healthy, just have this kidney problem, and you have to have a kidney donor lined up as well so you could go on to get a transplant. And these, these people actually said yay or nay, so that was their, their bottom line was yes, this person was going to live and go on and get a kidney transplant, or no, they're going to die. <coughs> Here's some um, uh, long-term dialysis patients here. This is their su survival. So we have about a 50% five-year survival, which means 50% five-year mortality. So everybody I start on dialysis today, I can tell them, you know, ha half the people I start today, they won't be with us in five years' time. They'll, they'll have died. So the uh, outcome, once we start somebody on dialysis, I mentioned chronic kidney disease is bad. Dialysis is even worse. And, and in this paper from uh, Italy, they've lined, lined up a whole bunch of other really bad things that can happen to you and told you, tell you how long on average you'll live. So uh, again, trick question, would you like to be on dialysis or have breast cancer? Pick the breast cancer. You're going to live a lot longer with breast cancer than you will on dialysis. Doctors are sneaky. If they're going to give you options like that, just pick the one that sounds worse. Uh, the other thing we can do is, we, instead of doing dialysis, we can do nothing, which is a recent idea that's come about. Mostly, uh, this was a study that came out of the New England Journal, 
and they looked at a group of people who were in nursing homes and then they went to see their uh, family doctor who told them they had advanced kidney failure and then they were put on dialysis. And this just shows what happens to them. So the dotted line is starting dialysis. The blue line is their quality of life, so their ability to do activities of daily living. You can see it falls off really spectacularly when they start dialysis. And here's their mortality. This is one year, 60% mortality. So suddenly they said, holy cow, why, do we, why are we putting these elderly people, infirm people on dialysis when their outcomes are so poor? There's another study uh, looking at it, putting patients uh, not doing anything or putting them on peritoneal dialysis. And on the left side are people who are elderly people who are fairly able to look after themselves. And it looks like they survive better with peritoneal dialysis. But if you look down here, these are people with uh, impaired basic activities of daily living, washing, cleaning, cooking, all those things. If, if those are impaired, you don't have any survival of, uh, advantage being on peritoneal dialysis. So increasingly, we see patients come through and we just say, have the long discussion with them and their family and say, dialysis may not be the best thing for you. Uh, just the other two options are hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Here's our hemodialysis patient. Uh, looks surprisingly like Clyde Shields from uh, 1960. We haven't advanced uh, terribly much, but again, a uh, vascular access and a machine which actually has a, a filter in it. <coughs> uh, peritoneal dialysis, we use uh, the natural membrane within the peritoneal cavity as our dialysis membrane. And this is uh, just a slide that shows uh, survival, and this is uh, groups of patients who are starting hemodialysis in 1996 or 2004, peritoneal dialysis or transplant. And transplants are the top, so transplant's a better option. People live longer if they get a kidney transplant. Uh, you can see the hemodialysis patients are down here, and again, their, their five-year mortality is, is pretty dismal, and it really hasn't improved over the, the 10 years of this study. Peritoneal dialysis has uh, actually shown a little bit of improvement over the last 10 years, and we kind of think that maybe our peritoneal dialysis patients uh, are doing a little bit better. And the other thing about peritoneal dialysis is that this is the cost of putting these people on dialysis. So this is in-hospital hemodialysis, $110,000 per year per person. So it's not a cheap therapy. Peritoneal dialysis is a lot better. It's around $50,000 per year per person. And then there's... Uh, uh, other types, we do a home hemodialysis, which is a little bit more expensive. And here's transplant at the end here, first year and subsequent year. So obviously a kidney transplant, if it's gonna last longer, is the cheapest option, but the second cheapest is uh, peritoneal dialysis. And just a couple of slides about transplant. So here's, this is from the uh, Canadian Organ Replacement Registry. And this shows uh, at the top, uh, this is going up to 2014, this shows the number of patients who are waiting for a kidney transplant and the number of patients who, uh, who got a kidney transplant in that year. And you can see that the lines are shifting apart. We're getting more and more patients waiting for uh, kidneys because we just don't have enough kidneys available. I stole this off their web website. I won't go out through all the details. Um, but uh, basically, we had 20,000 in Canada. We had 20,600 patients on dialysis and 14,000 had a functioning kidney transplant, <coughs> uh, and uh, survival 41% on hemodialysis, 52% uh, on peritoneal dialysis, uh, and then somewhere down here, there's 3,400 patients waiting for a kidney, and every year about 67 patients die on the waiting list that's waiting for a kidney transplant. So again, the real, really strong need to, to try and come up some, with some other options for these patients. Uh, so here's a couple of the uh, ideas that are floated around for new ideas, new ways we could uh, provide renal replacement therapy. Uh, the, the easiest thing is just to prevent people from uh, developing end-stage kidney disease, and that would be ideal if we had a pill or something or a treatment that would allow people to keep their own kidneys for longer. Uh, if we could increase the number of kidney transplants we do, the young woman I uh, outlined at the beginning, we're actually going to do a autologous stem cell transplant. So we're going to take her stem cells, wipe out her bone marrow, give her back her stem cells with the hope that that will reset her immune system and then we can, uh, uh, we'll reduce the autoantibodies and then we can uh, actually provide her with a kidney transplant. So pretty extreme things, but we do fun things like paired exchanges. So 
if my wife was going to give me a kidney, but we're not compatible, we are like socially compatible, but I mean, uh, Im immunologically incompatible, then we could get another couple who are like likewise uh, incompatible, but she could get her, her kidney to the spouse and I could get the spouse's kidney. So we can do paired exchange and then there's whole chains of transplants you can do uh, and it gets very exciting. So there's ways that we've increased the, the donor pool to try and increase the number of transplants. Uh, stem cells, whenever there's a new approach to something, you have to throw stem cells in there because what the heck, it's got to work one day. Uh, xenotransplant, this was just in the news recently. This is a pig, a baby pig. It's going to be a baby pig. And they injected uh, human stem cells into the baby pig and then they let them, the pigs grow to uh, fetuses and then they find that human cells are still uh, living within that uh, pig. So the idea is that we could inject uh, a few kidney cells uh, let's say I go in, into kidney failure, get a few of my kidney cells injected into the pig. The pig would grow up and grow a kidney that would be uh, a perfect match for me and would be human. Uh, and then we go from there. And then bioartificial kidneys is, uh, is what we're going to talk about in the next uh, two. Uh, uh, Morte is going to talk about. This is an interesting uh, study that came out just uh, a couple of years ago from Harvard where they took a uh, kidney from a mouse and they put detergent in it and they wipe out all the existing mouse cells from it so you're just left with the cytoskeleton uh, and then they take um, a bioreactor and they infuse the kidney with, uh, with stem cells and they infuse them both through the renal artery and through the ureter and these are just some pictures here, this is CD21 so this is showing that the blood vessels are growing in there um, there's a, a ECAD heron which is an epithelial marker so it's just showing that this kidney repopulates with the with a variety of cells that uh, one would find in a normal kidney. Here's another option for a, a wearable kidney. I don't know how this would work. I think these are absor uh, absorbent uh, things to take the toxins out, but it certainly makes him very happy walking around with this. And then finally, we uh, talk about a bioartificial or an implantable kidney uh, as a uh, poten potential option for, for these patients. And I'm going to stop there.